I first became aware of a movie called The Thing when I saw the original film. It was 1952, and uh, I would have been about four or five years old. I think I saw it in a re-release. It was one of those films where, as you watched it, it was so frightening that my popcorn flew out of my, my hands. In other words, when they went up to the doorway, and they had, they had this uh, a Geiger counter, he's, and he, they opened the door, and he's right there. I went nuts. I went crazy. And then I subsequently read the, the short story in high school, and I realized it was a lot different than the movie. What they'd done in the first film was kind of make the the James Arness monster more like a Frankenstein creature. And yes, he could, uh, he was a kind of a vegetable that could reproduce various life forms, but he wasn't the, the imitator, the creature that could imitate any life form from the original story. The John W. Campbell story, who goes there, was basically uh, an Agatha Christie kind of Ten Little Indians. You know, this creature is in your midst, and he's imitating either one or all of us, who's human and who isn't. And that, that kind of an idea really fascinated me. Uh, so we went, in that sense, back to that idea with Bill Lancaster and the screenplay. John Carpenter was always our first choice. Stewart had some relationship with him in school, the UFC film school. Uh, I knew John's work, I did not know him. And so we had a meeting with him, and he immediately said, yes, yes, yes. And as soon as we had finished Escape from New York and it was being released, I started to work on the thing. And we started writing from scratch. Basically, uh, Bill Lancaster wrote an original screenplay and started all over again. There were several drafts of uh, Toby Hooper had done, uh, I can't remember his name now, his partner had done a draft and there had been uh, some short story treatments by, by various people. But we started over and uh, the studio liked what we were doing and approved it and off we went. It was, I was reminiscing the other day, it was the longest prep that I've had on a movie. Um, and I haven't had one as long since. It was from the time I started going in an office to the time the movie was released, it was over a year. And the business has changed so much now that they only give you, they try to shorten your time on either end and try to make you do it really quickly. That was one of the luxuries of the thing, was to have that much time to work on it. Well, the short story itself was, uh... I wouldn't say it was a really great one, although it's a very admired one in the science fiction realm, uh, back in the late 30s. And I think it was the first story to deal with this, uh, this shape-shifting, uh, body snatcher type element and all that stuff. Curiously, that's not what 100% attracted me to the piece. It was more the ambience and this, all the characters involved and the mood of it, the, the enclosure and elements of the paranoia. The short story was a stepping stone to take advantage of all those kinds of elements. From the story and the film, I loved the idea of being trapped in Antarctica. These people working up there for whatever reasons. Horrible winter, freezing conditions, cold, and there's a monster lurking. Trying to talk about how to how to approach making a movie is, is, is difficult. Each one has its own personality. What what basically you start with is uh, an idea for a director of photography. Uh, you want to begin uh, meeting production designers. You want to begin uh, the process of setting up how to make the movie. And one of the big keys to me in in uh, making the thing was uh, discovering John Lloyd. You see, I had come from low budget filmmaking, and I had never really worked in a studio situation. And John uh, came along with uh, enormous enthusiasm and knowledge and a great uh, eye. Well, essentially, I was working for Universal Studio at the time. And the thing, the script came across my desk. And I you know, read it and said, my god, this is probably one of the best science fiction films I've ever read in my life. And then I heard about John Carpenter. He was coming on the lot, and I heard about his reputation. And I made a connection with one of the production managers to talk to him and then arrange an interview. And I took my drawings and things up and talked to John and ended up getting the show. I met John, uh, I'm not sure what year it was, but it was just before Halloween. It was, it was for Halloween. Um, Deborah Hill introduced us and um, we, uh, John decided that, uh, you know, we would uh, probably make a good team, and so we worked on Halloween. And uh, <clears throat> that, uh, I guess, was such an 
a good experience for both of us that uh, we began uh, a series, you know, and I worked on um, The Fog and um, Escape from New York, <coughs> and then uh, subsequently The Thing. And um, so, so I guess we went through a sort of that formative period uh, together. Um, you know, the, the work I did with John and um, the pictures we did together, I think were, was that, that period, some very challenging ones for me, and, and also um, a lot of fun because they allowed us to sort of experiment and work on, you know, visual style. Basically, it's a process of lining up the people to do the movie. And the, one of the crucial decisions we had to make was on the special effects and um, whether or not to hire, uh, what, what kind of an effects person to go with and what kind of a concept to go with. And I chose Rob Bottin. Uh, I saw uh, Halloween and I instantly became a John Carpenter fan. Uh, he was, uh, you know, that film is just amazing. It amazed me. And uh, I had the, the fortune of, uh, of working on a picture, uh, which was a Roger Corman film, uh, Rock and Roll High School. I met Dean Cundy. He did an amazing job on Halloween. I was also a big fan of him as a cinematographer and director of photography. And uh, I begged him to introduce me to John Carpenter. You know, I said, I gotta work with this guy. So I went in, I met John, and he was shooting The Fog. And I, you know, I said, you know what? Do you have any creepy kind of characters that, you know, are in this movie? I said, I'd love to play it. You know, you got anything like the guy with a mask in, in Halloween or whatever? He says, as a matter of fact, I do. You know, and um, actually just sort of burst in on this meeting, you know, and he's going, who's this guy? The Dean, right? And I'm like going, I'm your big fan, right? And, uh, you know, I asked him this question. Then he said, stand up. I thought he was going to say, and get out, right? You know, when I was hitting him up for this, uh, this part, you know. And uh, uh, he looked at me a second, he goes, you got the job, be there tomorrow. You know, you got to do this with the makeup, that, this. So I got to work with him and I was very happy and we had a uh, good working relationship and really had a lot of similar uh, interests and things. And he said, guess what? He goes, I'm going to do a movie called The Thing, you know? And I said, you kidding me, you're going to remake The Thing? And he said, yeah. He says, that's the idea. You know, and he says, I want you to make The Thing. Right, and I went, oh my God, this is fantastic, you know. And, um, you know, actually, uh, uh, after I did The Fog, I actually did a, a picture uh, called uh, The Howling. Uh, and uh, it was uh, such a big success for me. And I was about 20 years old when I did that. And I think I finished up the project when I was 21. And uh, uh, John saw the movie, you know, and he uh, called me up one day and he said, you gotta get in here, we're doing the movie now. You know, we're doing the thing, you know, you gotta get in here. He came in with a wild concept, which is that the thing can look like anything. It doesn't look like one monster, it looks like anything. And out of this changing shape, this imitation, comes all the creatures throughout the universe that the thing has ever imitated, and it uses these various forms. And Rob was uh, very daring in his approach. I must say, even sometimes I was doubtful as to whether he'd pull it off. He goes, I got an idea. He goes, we got a, he goes, we got a great storyboard artist on this movie uh, uh, named Mike Flug, right? And, and uh, uh, you know, and he says, you should go down to the Universal uh, Art Department, meet this guy. And I said, Mike Flug? You mean Mike Plug? You know, like that? And, and he goes, Plug, Plug. You know what I mean? He was really, John's a funny guy. You know, he's like, oh, whatever. He goes, he's a real funny guy, you know? And I said, yeah, I go, he, he did a lot of great comics. You know, this guy's like, I, you know, I'm a big fan, you know, because I'm like, you know, rabid comic book collector ever since I was a little boy. And I said, God, you know, Mike Plug, cool. You, you know, so, so he says, yeah, why don't you go down there and tell him what you just told me? And he goes, what I want you to do is sit there with Mike. And he goes, and I want you to go through all the scenes. And I want you to, to, to uh, show what it is you just told me shot by shot. And he says, because he goes, that's the only way we can do this thing, right? So it took a, a, you know, a couple of weeks to get all this stuff down. Then after we had finished the storyboard process, I piled them all up, you know, went walking back up to you know, Carpenter's office. And uh, he said, let's see what you got, you know, like that. And we pinned them all up on the wall, so covering all of his uh, office walls. Then again, he looked at me and he said, do you know how to do all this stuff? And I said, no, <laughs> you know, 
So that, that's what, that, that was really the challenge of that picture. And what was great about it was that John actually did give me a great opportunity to say, hey kid, you know, go nuts, you know, and use your imagination. And he was so supportive during the whole process that it was just, you know, a real amazing thing to happen to a 22-year-old. Well, we started uh, casting the thing and, and realized very quickly that we had to be realistic. And uh, although there are women who work in the Antarctic, uh, and that, that would be a real thing to put them in there, it's more fun, I think, I thought at the time, to make this an all-male movie, uh, simply because uh, you wouldn't have to deal with that issue. They had a girl in the, they had a couple of women in the, Hawks' version, and I thought maybe it would be a more of a streamlined approach in an all-male movie. I hadn't seen one in a long time. Uh, and I started casting with uh, Kurt, Kurt Russell wanted to play the, the lead, and he was the kind of linchpin, and then we just looked at every good actor we could find and uh, assembled a great cast. John was trying to cast the, the role of McCready, and uh, we spent some time together talking about that. Thinking, trying to think of other actors. I wasn't involved with the movie. And uh, he was casting the movie and, and had some of the other roles uh, cast pretty much when he, he was not finding what he wanted for McCready. And uh, I gave him some suggestions and we just as friends we were just talking about it. And then with about, I guess it was about three weeks ago or a month, maybe less than that, uh, he came to me and he said, would you, what would you think about playing it? And uh, so then I really read it and uh, said, yeah, I thought it'd be a lot of fun. At that time, we were going to try to do definitely a strictly an ensemble piece where McCready uh, was just one of uh, the group and very slowly uh, came out of the group to have to sort of deal with the thing at, at the very end. And that kind of changed slightly once we discovered that we had, you know, these makeup and uh, these wardrobe problems where everybody looked the same. I was asked to come in for another role. I, for the life of me, I can't remember what it was. Uh, um, and after I got there, John and I were talking, and we, we had known each other socially a little bit. And I said, listen, what are you thinking about Clark, the, the dog handler? And he said, I haven't really focused on that role yet. And I said, well, that's the one that interests me the most. And he said, really? And I said, yeah. He said, why? And I said, I, because there's something about him, the fact that he's more connected to the animals than he is to the people. I see him as a kind of loner, sort of strange other entity in the, in the group. And uh, I think he liked that, and, it, and I like the fact also he was sort of the red herring, the one that everybody thought was gonna be the carrier. And uh, we had the whole cast together, and we went over to Universal, and we sat around the table the first couple of days and talked about the script, and. Uh, talked about what the characters needed and wanted and so on and so forth. And then we worked on mostly the psychological aspects of it. That's what was most interesting, at least the way that the script, stripped of all the special effects when you first read the script. I, I never read the monster turns here and blah, blah, blah. You know, I just look at the scene. Uh, so we had a chance to work on that first and probably good because once we started shooting, the technical aspects began to take predominance. It ended up being great for me because I, I was the one who got to work the most with Jed, the, the wolf dog, and, and uh, Clint Rao, who, who, uh, who raised and trained Jed and I got to be good friends, and, and Jed and I got to be good friends. He was a very spooky dog when we started uh, because he was half wolf and half dog, and, and the wolf half was real dominant in him. He, he did everything like a wolf. He would never bark. He never growled, but the minute he would become uncomfortable, he would just so, suddenly go, and you just went, uh-oh, wait a minute. And he did that with me sometimes, and, you know, Clint had warned me, if you see, you see this look on his face, just relax, try and relax. <laughs> you know, he, something spooked him, and you never knew what was going to spook him. He was not very experienced working around people. So we had to really lock the set down whenever Jed was on the stage. And because he had to do that one scene where he went through the entire room and went underneath the pool table and everything, he had to go past almost everybody in the, in the company. So we were in rehearsals 
for two weeks, which was, it's interesting, John originally, I thought it was a great instinct, he'd never done it before, but to put this group of 12 people together and then try and figure out what the dynamics were gonna be between them, you know, who didn't like who, who felt, you know, who would react this way in this circumstance. And we came up with a lot of very interesting stuff in that process. But also we took some of the control away from John in the, in the process too because we really bonded and we got very interestingly involved with each other because of that. I remember at one point in the pre-production that John Lloyd came to me and said, okay, here's, here are our options. We're gonna have to go uh, probably up to British Columbia and shoot this on a glacier. In looking for somewhere to build the, uh, the set for the Antarctic ice camp, uh, they, they opted for Stewart, British Columbia because it was uh, purportedly one of the highest snowfalls uh, areas uh, accessible easily. We scouted it, uh, I believe it was in the, the summer, uh, when it was still warm, relatively warm, um, and the, the location we had chosen on this hilltop overlooking a glacier was still uh, essentially dirt so that they could build the camp. So we were, uh, I would say, six months ahead of when we would shooting, or when we would be shooting, we were uh, choosing the spot. It was a uh, little uh, knoll uh, on top of a mountain that uh, was accessible by a one-lane road that was also used by the, uh, the mining company. The mine road had only been open briefly and it was shut down after that, so it was kind of a unique thing to find because you just don't drive on top of glaciers, you know, you don't do it. And here is this place and it, uh, it worked. It was just right there and I, the only one problem, there were trees to one side, so I built the set, side of the set to hide that from the normal shooting so you wouldn't see it. But uh, I was really extremely happy with all that, you know, I thought it, uh, it looked right. My responsibilities were the um, opening title sequence, which involved uh, fabrication of the uh, miniature spaceship, which was actually built by uh, a person named Susan Turner. This is a spaceship from the opening sequence of the thing, used in two shots. It's principally made of ABS plastic. I made it out of that so we could, uh, could help hold all the heat that would be generated by these 144 lights we have circulating. Um, it has a lot of brass etched pieces, including the grill around the outside, the vents, the dome, the exhaust. I did that because I wanted uh, maximum detail possible, which is not possible in my opinion with styrene. I like the brass. It's painted with uh, many shades of gray. It's airbrush painted by hand, masking techniques. There's also a light in the dome, which is made of hammered brass. It was actually flat. Uh, when it was etched and it was hammered into shape in wood form. Uh, I wanted you to be able to see the lights at a continuous intensity through the grating instead of hot little hot spots or what you usually would get with a grain of wheat light. And there's an infinite uh, values of intensity and speed on this too. So when we got in and saw what speed we needed to have it go at to give the right effect, we would have the, we would have the option of uh, making, it go, making the um, lights go faster or slower, or be brighter or duller. We shot it at Apogee, four passes. The spaceship pass, the pass with the swirling lights to give it the motion, which is presumably powering the ship. There's another pass with a little uh, light on the top in the dome where presumably the, uh, the creature is uh, steering the ship and uh, we also shot a mat pass. The actual title itself, when uh, I did the effect for the title, what I used when the title comes, you know, the spaceship flies by and, and then the title comes and burns on. The, the way that that was done, we had like a, um, a fish tank that was about I don't know, four feet wide by two feet high. 
and I put smoke in the fish tank, and then on the back of the fish tank, I put the title, the thing, and I drew it on an animation cell. Uh, behind that, I had a piece of garbage bag plastic, which I stretched over a, uh, um, a frame, and behind that, I had a light, which uh, was pointed up uh, through the letters. And when I photographed it, I hit the garbage bag plastic with a uh, little flame, you know, like a match. I would just light it around the garbage bag plastic, and then the bar garbage bag plastic would open up and let the light come through the letters. And that's how the letters look like they form and, you know, and burn on with the rays and everything. It was actually a very uh, simple process to, uh, to do. And, uh, Look pretty good, although we went through a lot of takes. One one take actually um, opened up, forming the letters N G. I delivered the spaceship to Universal, to Al Whitlock's shop, and that's what they used to paint from. I worked with with Albert Whitlock for for the first and only time I've worked with him. I've been a great fan of his his work, and he's a, a man of unique talent. He does a, amazing amazing things with uh, paint and brush. And he did for us. He created this giant flying saucer in the middle of the snow uh, at a scale we couldn't do. And he solved some lighting problems for us because painting a snowscape with the correct light on it is, is not as easy as, as you might think. We had to do a lot of work on that. But uh, I'm extremely proud of what he did, and it worked out great. Well, the career in Universal started off really with the birds. Hitchcock called me in and I introduced myself as somebody that worked with him in England. And he really didn't believe it, actually. But after I talked to him for a while, he got to realize that I knew things that were absolutely authentic. And then he got interested. Well, after that, there was Tom Curtin, Marnie, all the films that he worked on are that he made after that, I did work on, because he liked doing bad shots. I mean, he liked doing anything like that. Earthquake was a very difficult movie in as much that Universal indulged in the luxury of booking films into the movie houses before they were even started. So it was a 12-week schedule, and there were 40 pieces of film to be done. Hindenburg lasted almost a year. But there were 70 odd scenes on that. In fact, the whole film was, George Scott's at the end when the film was finished, said it's his picture, not mine. Well, Albert Whitlock, um, I had met on the Hindenburg because I had been kind of a liaison with Albert on the Hindenburg. And um, I knew Albert very well, got along with him very well. and. Uh, really was, uh, I think, one of the um, shining periods of my career that I got to, to watch Albert at work and watch him do all his magic. All the matte paintings had an appropriate storyboard, so you knew generally what you were supposed to see. Very often we had an element that would be a live action element that was shot for a component of the matte painting, and that would just be cut in for the appropriate length, and then you would just wait until Albert delivered uh, his work, and then you just cut in his little masterpiece and away you went. And, and they dribbled in all the way through the making of the film. He would photograph, uh, say, the bottom half of the frame out on the ice field, or the top half and part of it, um, whatever was uh, important for the, that, and then take the film back to uh, Hollywood, not develop it, he would store it in the refrigerator, uh, cutting off just a very small piece of it uh, so that they could uh, develop just that for for testing and for lineup, and then painting a, a painting to match. So uh, it, it was actually an interesting process for me to go through. I'd, I've worked with him subsequently a couple of times to to look at really sort of one of the, the Hollywood masters and, and how he uh, did his particular uh, technique. Well, essentially what we did is uh, we just built a, a portion of, of a spaceship and uh, we planted that, then Albert Whitlock created this larger spaceship out of it. But the big problem was getting the spaceship there. We had to hook it to a helicopter and drop it. And then we went to shoot the, the uh, mat shots, 
And Albert wanted to wait till evening, you know, so she get the magic hour. And we waited too long. And the helicopter came, was waiting, and we waited, we waited. And finally, Albert says once more, and the guy said, now look, this is it, we're leaving. And so I remember we all had this heavy gear, and we tried to get in the helicopter, and I couldn't get the door shut. And so regardless of that, we took off. I mean, that was it. It was the end of the day. And then the guy gets partway toward the camp, and he said, my God, I think I'm going to run out of fuel, you know? <laughs> and then I say, well, if we run out of fuel, what will happen? So well, we'll just land. He said, well, I'll spend the night. And I can imagine spending the night in this helicopter with six or eight people, you know. It's, uh, but we didn't. We finally made it back, and everybody was happy, except the pilot. He said he really, we didn't realize, you know, really what kind of trouble we were in. But uh, again, ignorance is bliss in, in those cases. That we had to find a piece of high ground on the back lot because I didn't like working from a tower, unnecessary anyway, because the back lot at that time was very plain and very hilly. So we found a high spot and laid the sheets out and just placed the people in the appropriate position. The vital issue in making a match-up work is having things standing in space. If it doesn't look as though what you're painting is actually in space, dimensionally in space, receding from you, which doesn't necessarily simply mean the dissipation of color and tone, that's simple. But still to get the feeling that it's there st standing in space, if you don't achieve that, you don't achieve anything. It just looks like a painting. Remains two-dimensional. That's the main thing you're aiming at. Clouds, of course, help you get that. One of the things we were looking for was how to really create the feeling of, of cold, how to get breath from the actors' mouths. And we'd heard all the various stories that you know, the people in the film business had been trying up till then, the Lost Horizon stories and so forth. And we decided that refrigerating the stages was really there sort of the go. best thing. Um, we, we found out that uh, it doesn't have to be really cold as long as the humidity is up. So it was a very careful balancing act of uh, humidifying the air, spraying water overhead uh, to bring the, that and, and then bring the temperature down, um, which happened at one of the uh, hottest summers in, in Los Angeles in a, a long time. So um, it was very strange for us to work in this very kind of cold environment and then step outside in our park is in 102 degree heat to watch the tourists going by on the trams at, uh, on the tour and have them wonder, why are these people wearing this clothing? and it was sweltering. So pe more people got flu and colds and that thing. They'd come out wearing their parker, freezing. They'd come out and it's sweltering. They'd take off their parker. Now they're hot. Then they'd go back in and put it back on. It was so confusing. The thing that I remember the most was all of us, we got so tired of changing to go to lunch that we would just go to lunch in our complete well outfits in this brutal heat and just you know, and just kind of blow it off and go, well, it's going to be real hot getting over there and then I'll get there and it'll be air conditioned and it won't be that terrible. I remember that and I also remember for about three days or so I showed up in the commissary every day with a big ugly bullet hole in my forehead to eat lunch. And you know, when I would come in and I'd go, I, you should probably put me in the corner where everybody doesn't have to look at me because it was pretty disgusting. But and there were other people who showed up, you know, with pieces of them hanging off to go to lunch. It was, uh, it, we, were, we were quite a sight at the, on the Universal lot there. The thing for me was, uh, on the thing, was that the production designing of the movie was so um, perfect that uh, my job was easier. I could concentrate uh, instead on uh, the acting and telling the story and uh, the monster. I mean, that was the big job, was to convince the audience uh, that this thing is real. And we might have convinced them a little too much. Well, Rob Bottin has a great sort of strange imagination. Uh, and of course, his, his characters, likewise, the, the creatures and so forth. 
I was really intrigued and challenged by the fact that we would be doing some things that hadn't been done uh, up to that point in creating these illusions. We tried uh, all kinds of things, uh, cranking the camera faster and slower and, and under cranking and shooting uh, the camera upside down so the backwards action looked somehow strange. Um, a lot of different sort of photographic techniques. Um, one, of the, one of the tricks with working with rubber, um, whether it's you know, a mask or a, uh, a makeup appliance or whether it's a completely fabricated creature, um, is is lighting it carefully so that it uh, it looks real, so that there is a uh, you, you don't give away uh, the tricks, the little seams and the paint and the wires and and all of the things that are necessary to make it work. And uh, Rob was um, Rob was always very sensitive about uh, his creatures. There was you know whether there was too much light on them. Um, it, it, we uh, we always sort of joked that if if it was up to Rob, he would build the creatures, you know, to be incredibly interesting and, and imaginative and then not put any light on them because he was afraid of uh, showing them. So it was always a case of Rob wanting less light, less light, um, you know, so we, we developed techniques of little tiny spots of light and shadows and also that you, you never really looked blatantly at a rubber creature. I went to visit Rob on the set. He wanted me to help shoot uh, some tests that he was doing of his vibrating dog and I think when I got there, there were so many five gallon pails of KY jelly all over the place that it, it's like my my impression of the film was gee I I never knew that you could like buy KY jelly in in you know five gallon pails and have so many of them you know in in any one place you know uh, they they used so much of it I believe on all of on, on all of his creatures that that's kind of what I think of when I when I you know think of working on the film and you'd walk into their model room and you'd see what they were going to eventually come up with, you know, because they would model them in clay, I guess, before they uh, started the work on making you. And it was incredible to see. And uh, I, I must confess, I, I think I spent about 10 days with them, all told. Uh, they molded my face in a lot of different uh, expressions. They molded my hands, my legs, my torso. Uh, they even took photographs of my chest without a shirt on and they assigned one person to make the hair pattern match. And it was so good that the day we shot the sequence of my chest exploding, I was inside the examining table that my body was supposed to be lying on. So that my head was out, it was really my head, my neck, my shoulders, and my arms. And everything else was the model. And uh, Richard Dysart, who's an old pal of mine, played the doctor, the medical doctor came in that morning, and I was already in the harness, and he said, put some clothes on that guy, for God's sake, it's disgusting, and he came running over, and it wasn't until he was right on top of me that he realized that was fake. It was so incredible. When I see the picture, I know what my chest hair pattern looks like from looking at myself in the mirror for 50 years. I'm shocked at how accurate it is. And actually, uh, it was very funny because it was a one-take situation. We had to make him up and blend this whole body off, it had this interior mechanism that would rip open, right? And what happened was is, of course, take one goes awry. You know, after, you know, you know, 10 hours of makeup, right? And Charlie's sitting inside this box and is working on him and stuff. Uh, uh, you know, the cams are all set, tweaking the lighting, you know, getting it all set up, putting little beads of sweat on him and fixing his hair, making sure the rubber doesn't look too shiny and all this stuff. John says, action, right? The thing rips open, and I wanted to have like a lot of saliva flying all over the place. And unfortunately, what happened was is it looked like a fountain in Las Vegas. It came out, and it just looked like there should be showgirls dancing out of his stomach and stuff. And John goes, cut. Thank you very much, Mr. Botine. You know, like that. He goes, what happened? You know, he goes, that was horrible. You know, like that. He goes, it looked like a fountain in Las Vegas, right? And, and you know, Charlie's going like, wait a minute, you know? Do we got to do this all over again? And I look at him and I go, yeah, Charlie, I'm really sorry. And John goes, wait a minute, what do you mean? And I go, well, the stomach ripped open. You know, we got to, you know, take this all apart and put a whole new one on. And John goes, we got to do this tonight. You know, and I'm going like, oh my God, you know? So on the thing, take two meant hours, right? So we had to, you know, clean Charlie up, take him out, put a whole new skin on this thing and come back and do it again. And the second time we got it, you know, when it ripped open, you know, but that wasn't the end of it.
and it was, in, uh, it was about 6.30 or 7 by the time we got the second shot. I spent the entire day strapped in this harness. Uh, it took my back a week or two to recover, but uh, everyone was pleasant. In fact, the worst part was everyone, every two seconds, somebody would say, you all right, Charlie? You all right, Charlie? And I'd say, just don't talk to me. Don't talk to me anymore. When we actually uh, get to the scene, or, or the actual shot within the sequence where, uh, uh, you know, Norris or Charlie, you know, has, has his stomach open, and it's actually going to bite down on the doctor's arms. Uh, you know, what we did is we came in on a, on a shot where you would actually see the mechanism open, and we had, you know, the, uh, the doctor, you know, actually put his uh, arms in there and then start to close the machine, right? And then we cut. And what we do is, is uh, we come to another angle, right, where we've actually replicated the uh, uh, doctor's arms perfectly, making it out of jello, right? We made the arms out of jello. We, we had wax bones built into the arms, and we had rubber veins and gelatin veins and all this stuff, so it was like, you know, living tissue. And at this point, what we did was we actually took a mold of the actor's face that was playing the doctor. And what we did was we actually found a guy that had no arms. His arms were actually cut off here, right, in an in a injury, an industrial accident, right? And a uh, very, very great guy, you know, this, this guy. And uh, we basically made a, a prosthetic that actually looked exactly like the doctor and glued it on uh, this person's face. And um, we glued the gelatin arms onto his arms, right? So we have him in there, and what happens is the, the stomach is actually hydraulic, you know, so it's made out of something that would be like, you know, the same device that a tractor works with and could pick up, you know, a lot of, you know, weight. And when this thing slams shut, it actually rips right through the jello, punctures the plastic veins, which sends blood flying all over the place. And then the, the, you know, the actor with no arms you know, pulls his arms out and now he's just got the prosthetic damage, you know, on and blood shooting all over the place, you know. And that's a really good shot in the movie. You, you know, I mean, that, that, that one was really tough to do and, and very inventive, you know, very tough to do. I would even be scared to do that again. That sequence uh, is so... etched in the minds of people who see this movie. Everywhere I have ever been in the world, someone has spoken to me about it, and I kid you not. Everywhere I've ever been, I do a lot of traveling. Someone comes up to me on the street and speaks to me about that movie and about that sequence specifically. Then we actually had to start getting the, the, the uh, footage of his head coming off. And, you know, obviously for this shot, he couldn't use Charlie Hallahan, right? So he actually made like a perfect replica of this guy's uh, head. And, and uh, uh, fully, uh, you know, uh, animated it, you know, with uh, mechanical effects and whatnot, you know. And in it had a, uh, a hydraulic ram that would actually stretch the neck out and sever the rubber at exactly a perfect point. And again, this was only like, you could only do it in one take. All right. And when it, when it stretches open and the skin rips, what I wanted to see inside was something that was very reminiscent of like what's in a comic book whenever you see goo stretching or whatever. It's like this really stringy stuff. So we really didn't know how to make that stuff, <laughs> you know, and there was nothing that would sort of stretch that far. So what we did was we just started, you know, melting plastic and, and getting bubble gum, you know, and making this crazy concoction that I'm sure was like so toxic, you know, it, was, it couldn't be good for you, right? And what we did is we, right before the shot, you know, we had, you know, the whole replica of, of Hallahan's body. And we actually had this, this goo that we would pile in there really quick. And, and the whole time it's giving off fumes like paint thinner and lacquer thinner and all this kind of stuff. And again, we have effects guys buried in the little table underneath to operate the stuff. And then all these guys that have rehearsed the motion of the neck coming off and everything without doing the split. Camera set up, right? And everybody's going like, what's that smell? You know? And I'm going, oh, it's the, you know, it's the stuff inside the neck, you know, just some nutty concoction we made that'll stretch, you know, bubble gum and whatnot, plastic melted down. They're going like, oh, it doesn't smell too good, you know? So I go, well, we better hurry up and shoot it, right? So the camera said, everything's ready, and then Carpenter goes, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Shouldn't there be fire, uh, you know, like underneath the, the lens here? You know, and everybody goes, well, why? And he goes, well, because they're burning, they're burning everything around them. And this is the shot where the, you know, like the 
you know, the head stretching off and nobody seeing it. So just for continuity, we want a little fire in the, in the foreground. You know, meantime, nobody's thinking about it, and I didn't either, but the room is filling up with, uh, you know, explosive fumes, right? So, so uh, uh, finally, you know, the effects guy gets a fire. You know, there's like a thing called a fire bar, which is basically a pipe with a bunch of little holes drilled in it, much like, a, you know, you would have in a fireplace that works with gas. Puts it underneath the lens out of sight. And, you know, John says, okay, everybody set, ready to go? You know, I go, ready, all, all the guys ready? Everybody's ready, thumbs up. Hey, you in there, I'm knocking on the little, you know, box. You know, you guys, you know, you ready in there? Ready. You know, like that, okay, great. You know, so John says, roll camera. Right, so they roll camera. Right, and he goes, all right, light the fire bar. Guy turns on the gas. Psh, you know, stuff's coming out. And the guy's up there with a, with a you know, like a, a, a lighter. You know, and he's, tsh, tsh, tsh. and finally, it ignites, right? And the whole effect, the whole Hallahan, you know, replica body explodes, right? The whole room goes into this huge fireball with the whole crew sitting in it, right? Because this is a small set. And when the fire clears, everybody's sitting there like in a cartoon, you know, with their faces black, but you know, nobody had black face, but they were all going you like this. And I'm staring down at the, at the body and I'm in shock because since it's a one take deal only, I look down at it and I go, oh my God, it's on fire, right? It's on fire. And then John says, don't just stand there, put it out, you idiot, you know, like that. And then, and then, you know, I was just so shocked that months of work preparing for this moment was just blown to bits in, in just a second. So we, you know, put it out with fire extinguishers and stuff like that. And, and then he just goes, oh my God. We had to set up, take a whole nother day to get back to this point and finally just accomplish the one shot where the head stretches and, and the neck severs. All of us had, had made a trip to the shop. I had to get this little thing done for my head and everything. We all made a trip over there. Some of them, like David and, and Charlie, had to have very complicated things done. Uh, so I, I didn't spend much time there, but when we were at the shop, Rob had already started sculpting a lot of the things, like he sculpted the fused bodies that we find in the Norwegian camp. And that was lying on the floor when I walked by the first time. And I just remember thinking, this is, this is incredible art. This is amazing, grotesque art that he's created here. The same thing with the big fused dog thing. It was actually before they put all the hair and the, and the, and the slime and everything and all that pink slime, that, all that drippy stuff. And the, and the pieces of, of King Crab Claws or whatever the hell he used for that. Before he put all that stuff on it, it was an amazing piece of sculpture. Uh, just beautiful. I mean, grotesque, horrible, but also very beautiful. So what I did was I was so, <laughs> you know, wanting this uh, uh, stuff to come out so great, I actually uh, lived at Universal for a year and five weeks without taking a, a day off. I worked, you know, uh, seven days a week, never took a day off, you know, and I was there night and day, night and day, I'd sleep on the sets, you, you know, uh, a carpenter would come in, where's Rob, you think, oh, he's, you know, he's in the, he's in the locker room, you know, for, or he's in the lab, you know, uh, and then he'd wake me up, hey, you know, we got to shoot this thing or whatever, and I ended up, uh, uh, you know, working so hard that I ended up in the hospital at the end of the show. John looked at me and said, you don't look well. Maybe go, somebody take this guy to the hospital, right? You know, but since then, you know, I've, I've wised up and, you know, it's, uh, I don't do that anymore. When it comes to the creature effects on, uh, on the thing, it's, this is Rob Bottin's movie. I mean, and there was no, <clears throat> no loss for, you know, incredible effects. It was, a, it was a pretty hungry movie when it gets down to that aspect of it. We came in actually, uh, with uh, you know Rob's request, because it was an overload period where I think he had some <clears throat> some seven million creature effects going on, and uh, talked to me about possibly picking up one of the effects as as some of the overload, which happened to be the the dog thing at the beginning of the movie. Um, it was uh, we were just getting heavily into this uh, new element of of puppetry and animatronics coming together at my studio. And since I like Rob a lot, and I've also worked with uh, John Carpenter before, and it was a, a fairly fun and, and simple uh, situation for us, so jumped into it. It's one of the first effects that you see in the movie. These dogs have been taken over by, by the thing. 
So I attacked it in a way of uh, figuring out a way of how to do it simplistically, how to do it quickly and economically, and also create a, you know, a pretty nifty effect. And so we attacked it as literally a puppet. So when you do see this effect in the movie, I remember looking at myself in the mirror and going, how, how easily can I puppet something if this is the head? Because we were just starting to get into to puppetry at that point in our studio. And had us do a snapshot of me just holding my hand like this as a human being so that it was, this is about the most intricate and amazing a machine anybody could build. And then from that snapshot of me standing there just like this with my hand just like this, we designed the dog thing over that. <clears throat> so it was form following function. We did not create freely. We created based on the machine that was going to, to make this thing work. And when you actually see this dog thing in the movie, you will see that there's this hump, this interesting hump, and this long neck that comes out, and this really cool head that comes around, and is snarling and going through all these gyrations. And it has all this wonderful organic movement, and it's basically because all that organic movement is the person inside it who is disguised by the design. So we came up with a concept, designed to that concept, and literally built a really cool hand puppet with an animatronic face. We literally came in to help out, to take a little bit of this overload, and to do a really fun character and a neat creature and a neat effect, but it wasn't for the credit and it wasn't for the film. It wasn't my film. It was Rob's film, and he should be very proud of it. I'm, I'm thrilled for him, and I'm, I think what he did is outstanding. Some of the neatest effects we've seen, and I'm glad that we have a, a cool effect in the film. The big scene in the kennel when the, when the thing first makes its appearance and we set it on fire with the, the flamethrower and then put out the fire it was one of the most exciting things I've ever worked on because there were seven or eight cameras, nine actors with fire extinguishers and we really had to go in and put out the fire and the stage was elevated uh, 15 feet or so above the floor so there were real firemen underneath and there was a lot of safety apparatus for us but uh, I remember that you know usually the roll them, marker, action, and all those cameras clacking and the th flames building up from the gas jets and us waiting and then finally the call, we all went in and really put out that fire. It was really wonderful. The kennel sequence is basically broken into two areas, which is one, first the dog transforming in front of the dogs and then the point at which uh, the humans see it. And at the point at which the humans see it, it was very important to also understand that what, what again we were looking at was an amorphous shape that you know uh, you could really call a thing. So when the uh, uh, big mass or, or the dog or what it is transformed to pulls itself up into the corner of the ceiling, you know, trying to back up and escape, you know, from these guys and the dogs and everything, it just wants to be left alone. You know, it's got nowhere to go. You know, so so basically, you know, these guys are looking at it and they go to torch it, and what happens is it it you know rips open, and then this you know this uh, really strange kind of formation comes out that looks much like a flower. And in essence, if you go back and you know freeze frame, what, what it actually is is it's not a flower. It's it's about like I don't know how many dog tongues. You know, it's a bunch of dog tongues, and there's dog teeth growing out of the uh, out of the thing, and. I wanted something there that, you know, actually, you know, in, in the mind would sort of be, you know, something the dog used to be and has now, you know, changed into uh, something that is like a twisted nightmare. The burn, I remember the burn when, when David Clennon's eruption and, and then, we, then we burned him. That was, that was probably the biggest effect there that we all worked. And the guy who did the burn was, a, I don't remember his name, but he was a specialist at doing these full body burns and uh, that was very impressive and spooky to be a part of because what happened is he's got, he can't breathe once he's ready to go because if he does he'll sear his lungs. He has to do the whole thing holding his breath and it's all a matter of timing and then the minute he came off he had to be put out and immediately, you know, freed so he could draw breath and stuff. When I started seeing some of the effects that Rob had, had created, there was one in particular, one particular sequence where Charlie Hallahan's head comes off the table and 
a tongue shoots out and it pulls across, turns over, it grows stalks and walks across the floor. When I saw that, I realized a great sense of relief because what I didn't want to end up with in this movie was a guy in a suit. See, I grew up as a kid watching science fiction and monster movies and it was always a guy in a suit. Or sometimes it was a kind of bad puppet, like It Conquered the World comes to mind right now, Roger Corman's movie, this kind of vegetable monster kind of going like this woodenly. And my fear was they'll laugh at us, you know. They'll laugh at it, they'll be a joke. I mean, even as great as the movie was, and Alien was a terrific movie, it's still, in the very end, up stood this big guy in a suit. Oh, I don't want to do a suit. You know, I want something that's, that's alive. So I was, when I saw that stuff coming out, I was like, whew. oh, man. Now, there were some effects we had to fool with. They didn't work perfectly. Because this stuff is not like, as Rob said to me, it's not like ordering pizza on the phone. You have to build it and create it. And sometimes it doesn't work. In our case, uh, I think it did. You gotta be fucking kidding. Rob Bottin did the special makeup effects and Roy Arbogast did the, uh, the, the set special effects, the explosions and so forth. But they worked together in one area and that was uh, in terms of certain construction of, for the thing, certain um, size that Rob couldn't handle. In other words, his little team could go so far. So they inter intermeshed at one point and began a collaboration uh, to pull off uh, that last uh, creature coming up uh, coming up out of the floor and opening up, that was a huge monstrosity. And the size of it was amazing. So we had a lot of work to do. The first part, which was the, the pass where he actually has to run underneath the floorboards, that was done by Roy Arbogast. And what they did was they built actually like a train track underneath the uh, floorboards. They put like a huge ball, metal ball on it, and they actually dragged it with a, a huge cable mounted to uh, a winch that actually was a high speed winch. So they just flip the thing and then this ball would roll underneath and just break all the floorboards up and that looked very impressive. Then what we, what we see is the floor being ripped up and now we see this, you know, image of Wilford Brimley rising up out of this hole, you know, sort of stuck to a huge tentacle, you know, with all these tentacles that were, are writhing off of it. His chest actually rips open, this dog starts to struggle out. And because we wanted to open up the scope of what we were seeing, we decided to uh, use uh, uh, animation. And uh, there's this guy, you know, uh, Randy Cook, who's brilliant at, at stop motion animation. I worked with Randy before, and known him, known him for quite a while, and asked him if he would actually do this, you know, the wide shot, which would basically be the worm, you know, the Blair monster, you know, comes up through the floor, and now we're back really far, and we see, oh God, it's huge, you know, and tentacles come flopping out on the deck. You know, and, and then, you know, uh, we'll cut to a, a medium shot of the dog actually starting to rip through, you know, Brimley's, you know, chest. And then we'll come back to the wide shot and actually see the dog leap out and land on the floor right in front of Kurt. And so actually, uh, uh, Randy and his crew set to making a miniature version of, of the whole set. And it was absolutely beautiful, you know, really wonderful. The uh, miniatures for the sequence there, you know, it was in was inside a room that had a lot of oil cans and uh, some other miniature uh, uh, pieces. I can't explain exactly you know, what it is. Um, a guy named Jim Belahovic and again, Susan Turner, who built the spaceship for the beginning of the film. Randy asked me, Randy Cook, the animator, asked me to make it on a two and a half inch to a foot scale. So that seemed to be a good size for him to work with. So we made a rather large one. And of course, it has to be very solid to do dimensional animation. You have to have a very solid solid base so we made it very solid. We made it so a part broke away so when the floor exploded Randy could get right in there and work. And additionally when we built it we built it with no supports in the middle of the floor so that they could have the creature come up at any point. We hadn't quite decided yet. And of course we had icicles hanging from the top which we used silicone for because they couldn't be moved either with you know frame by frame shooting you can't you can't disturb anything. Everything has to stay exactly the same. I tried to copy the, the uh, live set exactly. I mean, it was rather difficult with the ice cave because it was just a jagged cave. And so we had, to, we had to measure each part out and make it exactly the right dimension so it would match. 
Well, I like to make it look absolutely, I know a lot of people like to take shortcuts, but I don't I like to make it look exactly right, because I think there's no substitution for having it be exactly right mathematically and visually. In the final picture, what happened was is Carpenter had it, the sequence cut together and felt that at the end of the day, his eye could detect that there was, you know, stop motion animation in the picture. And at this point in time, again, that, you know, since this was done, you know, many years ago, you know, we actually didn't have the use of a computer, which would kind of, you know, smooth out the animation a little bit. And so, you know, John decided that, no, we're not going to use the animation in the picture, you know, even though it was beautifully executed. We all met at Vancouver Airport, and then we were going to fly to Prince Rupert, where uh, we were going to get a plane to uh, Stewart, British Columbia. So we, we flew into Prince Rupert, and as we were coming down, we realized there was a snowstorm going on. So we thought it would be a little dicey if we were going to take a small plane and fly into, into Stewart. So we, we get into Prince Rupert, and uh, around 11 o'clock at night, they heard the entire cast in this huge like Greyhound bus or something. By now, it's continuing to snow, and the snow is getting deep. We're driving along. I remember Peter Maloney was sick from, uh, from eating something, and everybody was kind of falling asleep, and, you know, it's the lull of that, that bus as it's driving along. And we're all just about out of it, and suddenly we hear the bus driver yells out, Slide! Slide! So we, we all wake up, and the bus literally slides, and it starts going almost like off the mountain. I thought it was going to, like, bat bounce off the mountain and ricochet and throw us off the other side. There was no guardrail or anything, and it just plummeted for a thousand feet because we're in the middle of these snow-covered mountains. And uh, so now if this was a movie, you cut to the next shot. All, the whole cast, we were up in front of the bus, surrounding the bus driver with our eyes completely open, and we're driving at like 10 miles an hour now, and we're just kind of glued to the, <laughs> we're glued to the road. But Maloney's still in the back, and he's, he's sleeping. So about three o'clock in the morning, or who knows when, there was like a motel halfway to Stewart. And we were gonna pull in there to see if we could get some coffee, make some phone, I don't know what. But this, it's continuing to snow, so it's, it's really deep. So this Greyhound bus has to make a, a, a right-hand turn and then go up this hill into the parking lot of this motel or something. And the bus slides and it gets stuck, like right in that depression before you go up. And he couldn't get, the bus going. So like we're sitting there and uh, I'm not sure, but I'll take credit. I said, why don't we all get out, lighten the bus and we can actually push it on the ice or something. So you have this cast of amazingly talented people getting out of this bus in the middle of the night in Canada and lining up on the side of the Greyhound bus and they start to push the bus when the bus driver put it in gear and we actually got it moving so that he could get back up into the lot. Well, we got into the lot and um, the motel was closed. So we had to turn the bus around and we got back on the road and we drove for another two or three hours. We got into Stewart, British Columbia at five in the morning. Carpenter comes out into the middle of the street. He's like welcoming us. He's all bright eyed and bushy tailed. He slept and had coffee. And we're all like, you know, like we, you know, it was, we were a mess from being up all night. And, uh, and he said, welcome to Stewart. And, and that, was, uh, that was our arrival in Stewart, British Columbia. The conditions are almost unbelievable to imagine shooting a movie in. Um, and I, I, some, somehow there's a part of me that wonders how we ever survived it. We, we had such problems, uh, all the way down to the cameras. We, couldn't, we had to leave them um, in the cold because we couldn't take them from the warm uh, out into the cold, inside and outside, because the lenses would, would have been missed up. I mean, the whole approach was one of just uh, trying to push this giant, giant rock up a mountain. We had, we had no comforts. And it was a dangerous spot, make no, no mistake about it. We were in a very dangerous spot shooting this movie. And I think that some of the reality of that showed, I, I know the cast members bonded together and they really became their characters. They were really standing out in the snow dealing with, with the problem. There was a real camaraderie on the making of the film because these guys, I mean, they got, the actors got into the, the business of being scientists working together, thrown together. I would imagine in the real world, a group of people in an isolated environment would have to pull together and be friendly and 
We did some research, lots of research. People can go up there, the long stays. Uh, they bring cassettes and records and books, and uh, they would get flown in, like video uh, of, of Super Bowl games and baseball games. The actors tried to mimic that. They tried to copy that. Uh, there's been some great scenes where all 12 men uh, are looking at each other and trying to figure out who's who. If if you are my best friend or if you are about to thing out on me and kill me. But uh, my favorite thing uh, in this whole picture is is uh, to be able to be up here in a location like this and just be able to shoot up here. It's unbelievably fantastic. When the uh, set was built and then it uh, got snowed in as we had hoped, uh, we were then going up a uh, snowy, icy uh, dirt road, one lane, with uh, mining trucks coming down and radio contact back and forth. So the, uh, the trip up each morning and back in the afternoon or uh, in the evening was, um, was sort of uh, a, a long, tedious, and uh, sometimes kind of scary uh, trip. It was one of those things that paid off because you know, we were able to put the set in a uh, location that we would not have been able to otherwise. We lived in the town of, uh, of Stewart. It's the, um, one of the last ice-free ports, I believe, uh, so they floated a, a, I guess you'd call it a logging camp barge dormitory into the uh, port, and that was the, uh, the crew housing. Uh, it was a uh, large flat barge that had very small cubicles uh, in it with a, with a bed, and uh, it was uh, very much a uh, kind of a you know, college dorm situation for the crew, uh, and, and it, I think it, was, it, it made the, uh, the adventure more interesting, you know, and there was a certain bonding that, that occurred with the, uh, the crew. Um, but of course, it was not the most luxurious uh, conditions. The drive up from Stewart to the site on the glacier was a b 45 minutes of unbelievable stuff. Every day we passed eight tan bald eagles eating, you know, having just killed salmon, eating them on the side, of, on the snow, you know, blood covered snow. It was just amazing. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Oh, What's man. going on? We're on. Hey, this must be a Good movie. Morning. Everybody went up every day. So there were many days you just sat around and, and sort of did nothing except look at how beautiful it was. That was the extraordinary thing. We, even though it was 20 below, the gear we wore after a few days of acclimation kept you warm. And you could walk out on these fantastic glacial vistas. The, the, we were three quarters of the way up this huge glacier. And that pale blue color of the ice, it stretched for miles and miles and miles and miles down as it sloped down into the valleys. And the white snow all around you. And you just hints of the darkness of mountaintops. It's a sequence of images I've never forgotten, really powerful. I've never been that high up for any length of time in the, in the mountains in, the, in that kind of cold weather. It was just gorgeous. So I felt the sets up there gave us a tremendous feeling of place, which was important because the movie's about, on a psychological level, is about isolation. Even though there were a number of us there, each one of those men had his own little trap, little prison that he lived in, cut off from everything else except the guys around him. And then the introduction of this alien which couldn't be seen, but could be sensed, uh, intensified that experience for each and every guy in it. And that, that was, uh, I thought, the most interesting part of the movie for me. In fact, I felt my character, uh, Dr. Norris, knew unconsciously that he had been infected by the thing. And in fact, in the sequence when they're trying to decide what to do, when uh, they, uh, everybody's flipping out and running all around around the hallways, and somebody, I think it was Tommy Waits' character, had a gun. You know, they're talking about, and they, they wanted to take the uh, control away from Moffat. They asked me, and uh, my character said, uh, I don't know, fellas, I just, I just don't think I'm up to it. In, in my mind, he was responding to a signal from the inside that he didn't really understand, logically, that something was wrong, and he was the wrong guy. And uh, so, anyway, that, that business of being up there and seeing that that sense that you were really alone, nothing, the wind, the cold, all those elements was fabulous. Hey, oh, 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 oh yeah. Uh, okay. We won't have that white situation Six over there. Six in the morning. Right. So I, I think, think we'll uh, be okay. We, well, we made 
Well, we might want to do it. We could just do a little pull back from here. You know, say clear, clear him. Good from idea to come back, yeah. Into here, and then and then come into the situation here. That sounds good. And maybe sounds put good. Uh, Palmer pulling with the hydraulics in the front of the blade here. All right, good. Good. John Carpenter created a tremendous atmosphere on the set. It was very positive. Uh, it was uh, supportive, and it was also it encouraged you to work hard. John is one of the few directors who can walk onto a set and be faced with a scene that may involve five or six people and some complicated blocking and with no preparation um, work with the actors and arrive at a blocking that they're comfortable with and not one that he dictates to them and then decide on the spot what the most effective coverage for that scene is going to be. Um, that's a rare talent. Um, in scenes, uh, a particular scene, I think, which evinces that, um, that ability is the one in which the blood was in the refrigerator. They find the refrigerator and it's, all the blood's on the floor, it's been broken open. Uh, that's a difficult scene because you have a group of people in a semicircle up against a flat object. And if you think about that, that's an exceptional challenge to shoot effectively. I mean, one can take an easy cop out and shoot it from within the closure of the half circle, if you will, and take individuals on each. But I think if you look at that scene, it's much more complicated in terms of how he chose to cover it. I was very impressed with, with that scene. And the one that followed, where Windows runs down the hallway with the gun, which I think is one of my favorite scenes in terms of cutting, um, those two scenes in particular. Um, and John always gets just the right angles, very rarely. Uh, I can't ever really think of a time in which I would say, gee, I wish I had this, or gee, I wish I had that. And that's, uh, that's a testimony to his ability. This is U.S. Station 31. Do you read me? We found something in the ice. We need some help down here. Can anybody hear me? We found something. We found something. We found something. The reviews were mixed, I think, with the audience. And that the, there was an alternate ending to the film that was shot. I had spoken to John about this. Um, I had said that I felt, well, gee, this is a terribly nihilistic ending. It's very much of a downbeat. Perhaps we should protect ourselves while we have the principal, uh, Kurt, and just shoot an ending that, where we see that he survives. And um, John was open to this, so essentially what he did was he staged a scene in which Kurt has been rescued and uh, is sitting in a kind of a small office structure and he's just had a blood test so that we know that he's not infected. And uh, he has survived this ordeal rather than the kind of uh, mutual death that, uh, that concludes the film now. He just shot this for protection. We never previewed this. Um, the issue did come up at the conclusion of the two previews as to whether we should perhaps try this ending, see how it, it flew with the audiences, and or make other adjustments on the film. And I think John essentially at that time was, felt that he had achieved in the movie what he wanted to do. He had made the story of uh, Who Goes There, the short story from which the ori original thing was adapted. He was much truer to that, which I think was one of his intentions. He was a great fan of the original thing. He and I watched it at least two or three times. I, John's probably seen it 50. And it is a wonderful film, but he wasn't trying to do that film. He was, uh, in a sense, trying to go back to the, to the, to the source of it. And I think he, feel, he, he felt he had accomplished that. And, um, and so that's the way the film went out. A lot of the things, though, that bothered the audience more than the monster were the, were the were poking around the monster, you know, uh, and poking around human beings that had been burnt. And it was like we all associated to it in terms of uh, what's like gutting a deer. Um, it doesn't. It's part of life. Uh, if you hunt and you take the meat, you got the deer, and it's it's. I guess it's ugly the first two or three times you do it, but then after a while, it's, that's what you do with the, the. You take them out, you remove them, and clean it, get the meat clean, and then you cut the meat up. All of that kind of when you're doing it, you if if somebody's not used to doing it, they look at that and they go, "This is this is this is horrible," but they don't have any problem going to the store and buying that wrap piece of meat. Uh, so they just don't see the other part of it. So in this movie, you see that part. We realized that those parts 
were probably going to be, to a large degree, rejected. Again, I thought it was great that John didn't stop doing the movie that he set out to do. And I'm very happy that the movie did find its audience. And that it found its audience 20 years or 15 years later um, was to a great degree expected. People always come up to me and say, you know, I, you know, my favorite movie you were in was, I mean, a lot of times this happens that they come up with the thing as the thing, as the thing that they like the best. But uh, um, it's a, you know, as someone pro else has probably said, this film found its audience not in the theaters at the time. It wasn't a huge hit. It did okay. But in video and on cable and since then on video, it's, it, it has a very loyal, very uh, intense following. And that's always fun. I mean, I've been involved in several of those that haven't gone through the roof in the box office, but in certain ways have an afterlife that's much stronger than films that have gone through the roof at the box office. It was so much fun to be with that cast and that director and that crew. I mean, you had like 60 little boys with helicopters and flamethrowers and guns and a monster and we're up in the Arctic and I mean, it was a gas, man. It was like, it was like going out and playing cops and robbers when you were a kid. It was just, what? it was a fantastic. Um, <clears throat> experience uh, in a in a wild and unpredictable place with uh, just once again I have to say just a tremendous cast and crew it was it was just so much fun it's a good film and it, it's, it'll survive for that reason you know uh, it might not be an instant success but I, I feel that it, it has legs in the sense that people will enjoy seeing it and probably more so as the years go on I think that at the time when the thing was released, um, it it was an innovative, uh, very kind of unusual journey for an audience. Um, and I think uh, th that it, it came across uh, an interesting phenomenon, which was at the time uh, we also had a very friendly alien that came to visit the Earth uh, in the form of E.T. Um, and it was, uh, it was a case of uh, an audience uh, at the time, uh, feeling probably more comfortable with uh, a friendly alien, and the fact that uh, you know that the sort of dark edge of uh, the thing was something that wasn't uh, sort of appreciated at the time. Um, I think the the audience's sensibilities always sort of change, and uh, they're now sort of prepared to accept um, an alien that isn't so friendly uh, in the shape of. The thing. I really believe that if, if they had separated the releases somehow, that it would have been a big hit at the box office. It's since turned into a, what they call a cult film. Whatever, and it seems like everybody has seen it on video or on television or something. Uh, it's uh, it set a standard for special effects. I think that the people who like that kind of movie went and saw it anyway. The interesting thing about the thing, right, and and the fact that it was actually done a long time ago. You know, people actually think that that you know the uh, uh, the imaging and the special effects and the creature work or whatever hold up to this day, even in, in even in light of the fact that you know there are computer graphics and things now. And I think part of the reason for that is is that it's you know you just can't beat wild imagination, you know. And no matter how you do it, as long as it's executed very well, you know it, it uh, you just can't pierce through the magic. Um, you know, actually, uh, it's really funny because I watch the movie now and I can completely pick it apart. You know, I mean, I can actually look at it and go, you know, I do that differently now. You know, I could do that better, you know. But, but uh, the fun thing is, is that everybody that, you know, like I run into on the street or in the movie business or whatever, they always say, do you realize that, you know, your monster creation and the thing, uh, was a life-changing monster. And I go, what does that mean? And, they, and you know, like I even have you know, kids that actually grew up watching it on video. And they say, yeah, it was just so crazy. You know, it, and it just sort of made us realize that, you know, you could do anything in the movies, you know? So it was, it's fun to have, you know, that, you know, part in history is, you know, having made something that was so wildly imaginative that it's actually, uh, you know, caused others to, you know, come up with greater dreams. There are some movies that you do 
Um, I've done more, I guess, than my fair share of them. Uh, and I do think that, you know, maybe that, that I have to sort of look at that and, and, and realize something, that I have a tendency to, to like movies that aren't per gonna perhaps be accepted at the time. And uh, if they're done well, though, they, they will be accepted later on. And I think that with the advent of video, that's, that's a great, uh, I, I, I'm very happy about that because ultimately you're making movies for the enjoyment of as many people as possible. And I like that there's video and that people can take it and make their judgment later on and perhaps without the politics of the time or without whatever's in the air at the time to set a tone to get in the way of just the project and just the, the story itself. There's a very somber, uh, a somber kind of inevitability to the film. As it begins, you're seeing a helicopter flying and they're chasing a dog. And already, it's, it feels like the end of the world. And that's what this is. This is an apocalyptic movie. This is the first of, of three films that I've worked on that have an apocalyptic theme. I've dealt with them in different ways. This is the end of the world. It doesn't come from bombs dropping. It comes from within. And it, it was a movie that, that's tone started and, and finished. And, and basically it was almost there's nothing you can do because here it comes. And of course the thing is a metaphor for whatever you want to say. It's disease, could be AIDS, could be whatever. But it comes from within you. It's also um, basically uh, the lack of trust that, that's in the world now. We see it all over countries, people. We don't trust each other anymore. We don't know who to trust. Uh, we're with somebody that, that we think maybe uh, they're our loved ones and they may attack us. Um, and that's what the thing is. It's, it has a lot of truth in it, kind of dressed up as a monster movie.